philosophy of the company. Let's see. Well, you know, we're purists. And uh, what I think sets us apart from a lot of record companies is that we take our time in the mastering process. And uh, whereas your normal record company is under great pressure to get an album done in a rapid amount of time, we take our time. And it's what my old boss used to call mastering by the pound. They had to get so much product out by a certain amount of time and then get their billing done. Mm -hmm. We're about the quality. It's more like a handmade piece of furniture, if you will. It's mm -hmm. everything that we do is uh, high quality and it sounds it. I think that the product pretty much speaks for itself. Welcome, Jamamichi speaking. You're about to depart on another excursion into the realm of unleashed sounds. Hello, Vinyl Community, and welcome back to another Tales of the Dead Wax. Uh, this one is going to be dedicated to the MoFi guys, as you can tell from the intro. Uh, this will probably be my last dedicated mobile fidelity video for a while, and i got to thank Robert Z for being the inspiration of this. Uh, also, this is kind of retreading the ground for the blog article that I did for the Needle Groove, which I'll include a link down below. Uh, but let's just get into it. So, uh, as I said in another video, Mobile Fidelity, they've been around for a long time, and uh, there's a very good video with an interview with Sean Britton. And it, it's true, they've been around since the 60s, but in terms of making audiophile recordings the way we know them today, it really didn't kick off until 77, uh, I want to say. Uh, but... Uh, the mastering engineer that uh, was key to their success early on and uh, did the vast majority of their mastering was a guy by the name of Stan Ricker. And um, Stan Ricker, you know, when he started working for MoFi, uh, and the fact that they were using half speed master, uh, and half speed mastering means they run the tape at half speed, uh, decided to use a very unique dead wax signature. Uh, just to show you an early piece, uh, this is Gordon Lightfoot, and uh, this is one of the original early ones, and you can tell uh, by the header here. Now the header, uh, there are some people that don't like it because they, they say it takes away from the artwork. Uh, I personally like it. I, I like the distinction of what they're doing. Uh, it makes it kind of easy to identify, kind of like an impulse release. Uh, but you'll notice that the the letters here are not italicized. So if you got a very early pressing, uh, you know because the letters are not italicized. So like Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, you'll see two different variants. Ones that it, ones that are not italicized and ones that are italicized. So if you have the ones that are not italicized, you got a very early pressing. Uh, also, <coughs> they, you know, they... They went through different iterations of the label. The early ones, uh, kind of like a homage to the environmental sounds, kind of had this type of label before they adopted their own original master recording label. I mean, it says original master recording at the top. Uh, but here's a picture of Stan Ricker's dead wax here. So you can see SR over 2, uh, which is his saying that it's half speed mass. Just to show you one thing here, so all of the original pressings from the 70s and the 80s were pressed at the JVC plant um, in Japan. So uh, Robert Z is showing some of the Ultra Disc CDs that were also pressed in Japan. The vinyl was pressed on uh, JVC proprietary vinyl, uh, very similar to the Quiax uh, vinyl, but as you can see here. I'm shining a light right through it. So, uh, Classic Records also experimented with vinyl formulation, and they had their uh, versions uh, that were also semi transparent until they got perfectly clear. Now, uh, of course, early on, this is not an original sleeve. I, 
I had to change it out, but you know, they use the early rice paper, paper sleeves. Uh, the J card, or the card that they, the stiffener that they put in, also started early on. So here's an original card here. And here's just kind of an original flyer of some of the original releases. So that is one of the early pressings of MoFi. Now let's let's move on through history here. So uh, I don't have any Anodus pressings, uh, unfortunately. I'd really like to get my hands on one just to see what what they look like. Uh, I'm assuming that they had some very similar people uh, do the mastering job, including Stan Ricker. So uh, I do have a hole in my knowledge set, uh, but Stan Ricker uh, helped them out, helped all the the engineers out. Uh, during the Anadesk phase, as far as I can tell, and also when Music Direct uh, purchased the company in 99 when it went bankrupt. Now, Stan Ricker uh, started to train uh, a couple of the, the mastering engineers. So, Sean Britton, for one, uh, was one of the guys that he trained, and this is an album that they mastered together. So, this is Madeline Perrault. And uh, this is just by far one of my favorite albums by Madeline. Just phenomenal sounding. Uh, in one of the uh, interviews with Sean Britton, which I'll link down below, and I'm kind of showing you up here, uh, he talks about using one of these albums just to test the mid range. And I got to say, I agree with him. It's just wonderful to listen to. The, the vocals sound so natural. Um, this is again when they were starting to flesh out the the new uh, label that they wanted to use but here's a shot of the dead wax which shows Stan Ricker and Sean Britton together. Sean Britton uses SBB over two in homage to his master. Uh, another guy that uh, was being mentored by Stan Ricker is a guy by the name of Rob Loverde. Uh, Rob had his hand in a lot of the Sinatra uh, releases. So the Sinatras are, again, fantastic. And I recommend picking them up now if you can because these are out of print. Some of these can be had fairly cheaply. But uh, Rob Laverde has been doing a lot of vinyl mastering for them now. But uh, now he's kind of moved on to the Super Audio CD hybrid disc route. So just to show you the label here and to show you his dead wax and of course you'll see the RBL over 2. So again, reflecting the half speed mastering. Just to show you another example of Sean Britton's work. So Sean Britton did Abraxas. Of course a lot of people are excited because MoFi is experimenting with another new process for mastering which removes a step or two in the production process, the metal work, and they're calling it the ultra disc. Uh, so this guy is being reissued by them as this new ultra disc. Uh, preliminary reports for, from some of the audio shows is that it just sounds phenomenal. Of course, they're charging a premium for it. It's $99 for this album. So I'm very curious to get my hands on a copy. Uh, they are going to be limited. Uh, right now, Music Direct is saying that they're going to be limited to 2500 So if you're curious and you're willing to fork over the cash, uh, I would pick it up now because it's going to be gone. And just to show you what the dead wax looks like on this one, uh, Sean Britton, of course, he can be creative and he can actually put messages in the dead wax. And here's what one looks like. A lot of people have asked, uh, well, you know, they're doing CDs, they're doing super audio CDs, and they're doing vinyl. Uh, is it really worth it to pick up both? Isn't the mastering the same? Uh, the answer is no, the mastering is different in a lot of cases. Uh, MoFi is unique in that they use sometimes dedicated personnel to do different masterings. Um, not always the case, so the Beck Sea Change album is one of those ones where uh, Rob Loverdi did both, um, uh, but here is John Lennon's Imagine. Um, now, MoFi, I want to say, you don't always have to look at the dead wax to see who did it. Uh, usually, they will actually put it on the jacket itself, 
And uh, so here is another mastering engineer, which I want to talk about, is Paul Stubline. Uh, Stubline uh, does a lot of the Silver Series, uh, just to show you the dead wax on this one. Now, here is the, the CD version of this. Again, if you're obsessive, then you get both. I am not obsessive. I have a few examples where I have gotten both, but no, I, sorry, I don't have the money to get everything. Uh, but here you can see, let's see if I can get that to focus, you can see that Sean Britton uh, did the mastering of this. So again, different mastering engineers. You got two people dedicated to get the, the best quality out of the medium that it is intended for. Now I talked about the Silver Line series. So this is an example of the Silver Line series. So this says Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab on top and not original master recording. I kind of covered this in my last video. So why the Silver Line series? So they are not getting the master tapes in all cases. Um, they are trying to get the next best possible source. It could be a first gen copy in some cases it could be a high-res digital transfer we just don't know but you know the challenge is, is getting the master tape so they're based in California and they have to pay insurance on the master tapes that they take and there are some companies that do not want their master tapes leaving their facility so like if the tapes are on the East Coast or in another country those labels don't want those tapes flying over the ocean. Now, in the early days, yeah, they were a little more open to it. So, of course, the Beatles box set that MoFi did, yeah, sure. At that time, they let the master tapes over. But now, you know, with vaults being burned down and master tapes getting lost, they've really clamped down. So, you know, the master tapes for this uh, could reside in the UK, and I'm sure that Tears for Fears don't want those tapes flying all the way over to California. I mean, they're taking some risk, and of course, MoFi may have to pay a premium. That's just kind of an assumption on my part, just to get the tapes. So, you know, it may not be worth it, and so they're going with the next best possible thing. Now, Paul Stubline uh, did a lot of the early Silver series. He didn't do them all, but, you know, those are the ones that really had his signature on it and just to show you what the dead wax looks like on this one now here's what the label looks like on this now people ask well why is the silver series cheaper well you know the production cost is not as much they're also not using 180 gram vinyl with these uh, a lot of cases it's 140 so they feel a lot lighter so it's not quite the same but they still sound reasonably well I mean they sound good I mean there's some debate some will say it's not as good as an original but you know it's all personal opinion uh, I happen to like what they put out uh, some of the Silver Lines series has been dinged but I enjoy it uh, now, so here's another original that was done by Stan Ricker. Now, MoFi has to license the titles, and then they will lose the rights to do it. And occasionally, they regain the rights. So this was done uh, originally in the 80s. This is Alan Parsons' project, iRobot, which is just phenomenal. This was a single disc, uh, again, done by Stan Ricker. But the last person that I want to talk about is Krieg Wunderlich. And this is a case where they regained the rights. And they did the title as a 45 RPM disc. And why 45 RPM? Some people wonder why. Well, uh, if you look at a 45 RPM disc, you can actually put more information on it. And you're actually putting less songs. Uh, some people complain that it's annoying that they have to change the the sides every couple of songs but you get more dynamic range out of a 45 rpm disc and that's part of the reason why they're doing it is you know they want to produce the best sound quality they're trying to get the most out of the, the master tapes now here's a shot of Krieg Wunderlich's uh, dead wax he just uses KW at MoFi 
And as far as I can tell, he's really the premier. Uh, as far as I can tell, he is the premier vinyl cutting guy as of now. Uh, a lot of their newer vinyl releases, they all have KW at MoFi. Uh, it appears that Sean Britton and Rob Loverti have been doing a lot of the Super Audio CD stuff. Uh, Paul Stubline, he's moved on. I haven't seen him do so much work uh, as of late, and unfortunately we last lost Stan Ricker uh, a year or two back, which is unfortunate because he is one of the best-known mastering engineers in the in industry, or he was uh, at the time. So. There you have it. Uh, did I get anything wrong? Do you have any comments? Did I miss a mastering engineer? Uh, please shoot me a comment down below and thank you very much for watching. We're going on a remote trek to the far reaches of our American railroads in the West, revealing the wonderful, almost forgotten sounds of the few remaining steam locomotives in operation. Nostalgia? Yes, you may call it what you like. We call it railroading.